us. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the UT Alston Portugal session in Ciencia 2020. Um, as any, uh, any other sessions this year, it's a bit uh, particular. Um, I'm just imagine this auditorium full of people, so I'm also talking to everyone here in the auditorium. Um, and uh, I would like to welcome to the session uh, and tell you a bit about uh, how far we have come in this uh, new phase of, of, of the program. And um, actually, uh, so we started, we started the new, this new phase two years ago. Um, the, the, the first year was very, very enthusiastic with many uh, uh, activities on all our uh, um, instruments, on the way we, 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 we uh, promote and do activities. And this year, uh, I must confess that we are all quite afraid of, 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 of how this everything would go, uh, how people would adhere and would, would get enthusiastic. And at the end, we might have had the, 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 the most uh, excited uh, uh, year in terms of activities, in terms of, of participation of, of, of the communities, both in, in UT and also in, in, in Portugal. And um, right now, we are just sowing the, the results of the 2017 uh, exploratory project. So they are coming to an end and we are just seeing uh, uh, everything that has been accomplished. Um, we opened two calls, uh, a call for a strategic projects. So these uh, big projects uh, with, with uh, two PIs each in UT Austin and uh, uh, several others, depending on the consortium, here in Portugal. All these projects are, let's say, uh, led in terms of innovation by uh, a Portuguese company. Uh, we approved 11 uh, uh, projects in a total amount of more than 20 million euros. And from these 11 projects, 10 are led uh, in terms of innovation uh, by uh, SMEs and one from a, a, a big company. So these are big projects, very hard to, to put together, uh, but I think the communities in both sides of the pond really uh, uh, managed to, 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 to do fantastic things. Um, and if it, this was not enough, we had a call for exploratory projects. So this high risk, high impact projects for one year. And these have one PI in UT on one PI uh, in, in, or two in, in, in Portugal, depending again on the, on, on the consortium. And um, we, we, we ended up with, with eight uh, exploratory projects from, from a, a, a set of very, very interesting and, and uh, potential uh, um, applications. So everything is happening. Uh, we, we are just uh, managing the, 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 the whole situation, but people are really engaged, are really uh, doing a lot of, 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 of activity together. We managed to have, I think, more collaboration between people in UT and, and, and Portugal than we had before. So everything is really promising uh, um, and, uh, and uh, we have real reasons to, to be happy and to be enthusiastic about w what will happen next. So without further ado, uh, I would like to, to pass the floor to Andrea uh, Passos that will uh, carry on the, the, the presentations and debate from now on. Thank you very much. Keep safe, okay? Bye-bye.
So, hi everyone, my name is Andrea. I'm the executive director of the UT Austin Portugal program. So I'm very pleased to be here today in a completely different environment. We don't have the opportunity to have everyone sitting here today, but technology is helping us to overcome you know, the problems that uh, were brought about by this uh, virus. So we tried to put together an interesting lineup that will give you an overview of how the program is delivering on its mission. And in our opinion, there's no better way to explain what we have been doing so far than to hear from the voice of the people that have been benefiting directly from the program and also from people who have been supporting us in implementing these initiatives. So we have a tight schedule uh, and I'm very pleased to announce our first uh, speaker. She's the principal investigator, um, uh, principal investigator of one of the projects, an exploratory project that we've been supporting since 2018. For those who are less familiar with this kind of instrument, the ERPs, they're short-term, goal-oriented scientific projects on um, emerging transformative topics, and they hold promise of evolving into higher technology readiness uh, levels. So in this case in particular, we are bringing the project DREAM, so Drug Delivery Nano System for HPV Infection Therapy, basically a project in the area of nanotechnology that is um, using uh, the know-how in the nanotechnologies field to uh, develop very high precision treatment regarding cancer. And to walk us through this project, we have today here with us, or not here, but uh, joining us remotely, uh, Carla Cruz. And Carla, she's an assistant researcher in the Health Science Research Center at the University of Baden Triod and invited assistant professor at the Faculty of Health Science. So she has two patents granted. She's the principal investigator of 10 research funded projects, including the UT Austin Portugal programs 2017 ERP Dream, and she has been collaborating with several international institutions. So thank you very much, Carla, for joining us. And you have 15 minutes to walk us through this, this project, wonderful project Dream. Thank you very much. Okay, and, uh, thank you. I will share my presentation. Okay. It's okay? Yeah? So thank you, thank you, Andrea, for the nice presentation, and thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present the results of Project Dream entitled "Drug Delivery Nano System for Human Papillovirus Infection Therapy." So the, the consortium of uh, of this project is composed by Centro de Investigação em Ciências da Saúde da Universidade do Interior that is the leading leading institution, and uh, uh, several partners the University of Austin uh, at Texas, uh, namely the College of Natural Science, the Associação Instituto Superior Técnico para a Investigação e Desenvolvimento, namely the Centro de Ciências e Tecnologias Nucleares, C2TN, the hospi a Public Hospital, the Centro Hospital, uh, Hospitalar Universitário Pava da Beira, and the company LabFit Health Products Research and Development. So, uh, the idea... The idea of, of uh, the project DREAM, and the acronym DREAM means a lot, uh, arise from the, the need of the, the, the developing of effective treatment for persistent human papillovirus infection. Uh, because the, 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 the persistent human papillovirus infection leads to cervical cancer. So uh, we need to improve the treatment options for women that is already infected. Uh, uh, usually is a, a symptomatic, uh, have a symptomatic uh, symptoms, and uh, uh, the vaccination is very effective uh, at the moment, uh, but only for women that is not uh, have been infected by, by the virus. Um, so the, the main objectives uh, were uh, synthesize and characterize uh, several uh, nanoparticles that we select. These nanoparticles uh, are based on nuclear acids of the MERS, namely G-quadruplex structures and drugs. Uh, after that, we evaluate uh, the nanoparticles in human uh, papillovirus infect cells and uh, cancer cells uh, versus normal non malignant cells, and also in human uh, tissues of human infect by the, the virus. 
Uh, after uh, finally, we 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 select the promise nanoparticles and formulate these nanoparticles a prototype product in, uh, with a collaboration with the, the, the hospital, of course, and uh, the lab feed company. So this this uh, formulation is for topic is a topical product. Uh, to, to be applied uh, uh, in the genital part and dermal, uh, for dermal and genital application. So, uh, our nanoparticles, uh, all the nanoparticles uh, are composed by nuclei acids of the mares. Uh, I, I show in this picture an uh, example of uh, of the mare, is a IS 1411, is a, a nuclei acid that adopts uh, a specific structure, is adopts a G quadruplex structure. And this aptamer has a specific, of ta a specific target that is a protein nucleolin that is uh, overexpressed in cervical cancer cells and also uh, in HPV, HPV uh, uh, infect cells. So this aptamer have already reached phase two of clinical trials and uh, uh, show several advantages and several disadvantages. So DREAM uh, uh, use not, uh, not only the IS-1411 aptamer for the, the nanoparticles, but, but also uh, several deriv derivatives of this aptamer uh, to, to, to improve this disadvantage of, uh, of, this, of, the, this, the, of the IS-1411. So uh, just a, a, a quick slide. Uh, this is a nice picture of that we found in Sintra of a similar uh, structure of a G quadruplex. So, so very nice analogy of, of G quadruplex. Uh, so the first task of our project was a synthesis of nanoparticles. So we select two to uh, deliver uh, nanocysts, to, to deliver drug deliveries. So the, the gold nanoparticles and nanoaggregates. These nanoaggregates are composed by lipids linked to, to oligonucleotides. Uh, so we link, we, we link these deliver uh, uh, systems to, uh, to derivatives of this, this aptamer, the IS-1411 that I show you in the, the, next, in the, in the, in the slide the previous slide. So these derivatives, all of these derivatives uh, um, form a G quadruplex structure and the target is the, new, the protein nucleon. We test this in the lab. Uh, after that, we will encapsulate several drugs. These uh, are antiviral, anti-cancer drugs. These are commercial drugs that uh, are used uh, in, the, in the clinic. And also we, we develop and synthesize a, a new a potential drug, a, poten a potential compound uh, that is a cridine orange derivative that present uh, anti-cancer and antiviral uh, effects. So this, this uh, ligand was synthesized by our partner from the c 2 so after that, in task two, we characterize the nanoparticles by several uh, techniques, uh, namely uh, electronic microscopy and uh, dynamic light scattering by, to check uh, size and uh, distribution and other techniques like nuclear magnetic resonance and uh, so on, spectrometry of mass spectrometry, so on. Uh, and uh, in task three, we evaluate the, the, the nanoparticles that I, I present. So we evaluate um, uh, as the antiviral effect of the, these nanoparticles and the anti-cancer effect. For the antiviral effect, we use uh, human papillovirus cells infected with the 18 and 16 high risk HPV. Uh, we do this in collaboration with the uh, institution from Penn College of Medicine from Pennsylvania. And uh, the anti-cancer effect, we, we, we check in cervical cancer cell lines, different cervical cancer cell lines uh, versus non-malignant cells. Uh, after that, we select the, the promising uh, nanoparticles that, was, that were two, two, two nanoparticles and develop a vaginal, a vaginal gel for topical application in collaboration with uh, LabFit. So uh, the next slides, I will present some results 
uh, of the antiviral effect, anti-cancer effect. So the first, uh, the first uh, in this Im image, we, we present some results regarding the antiviral effect. So we grow uh, cells infected with the human papillovirus 18 and 16. Uh, and then we incubate our cells with our nanoparticle and we, we evaluate several, several parameters. Namely, uh, the, we, we check the inhibition of the growth of the cells. For example, you can see in this image that uh, human, this cell, the, the thinning of this cell in fact with the uh, human papillovirus 18 decrease. But, but our, these nano, nanoparticles don't have effect in human papillovirus uh, 16. Also, we determine, determine evaluate the, the, the genome copies for, of, uh, of the virus in the presence of our nanoparticles. You can see that the, 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 uh, our, our, the nanoparticle decreases the number of copies of virus when we increase the concentration of the nanoparticle. Also, we determine, determine the viral titer of uh, uh, after incubation with the, our nanoparticles, sorry. we can see also that the viral title decrease in the presence of the nanoparticle. Uh, so we have effects in the human papillovirus 18 replication and particular in the viral capsidation. So the number of uh, virus, the capacity, the ability of the virus to infect the, the new cells decrease. So this is a nice result we already published. Uh, after that, we evaluate uh, the anti-cancer effect also. So we evaluate antiviral effect, anti-cancer effect, because we dream, the, the main objective of dream is uh, uh, improved treatment of HPV infection to avoid cancer, cervical cancer. So we, we also check if our, our nanoparticles have any effect in the, in the in cancer cell lines. So we use different cervical, cervical cancer cell lines. In this slide, I only present ILA cells. is a, a type of cervical cancer cell lines. And this NHDF is a non-malignant cell line. So you can see that in this graph, we have two types of nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles bound to the aptamer and encapsulated drug, the imikimo that is anti-cancer drug. And this is a CH, our compound that we synthesize under, uh, we, under a DREAM project. So we can see when we increase the concentration also, and in, in presence of the, our nanoparticle, the, the cell viability of the cervical cancer cells decrease, and the, the viability of the non-malignant cells maintains. So this is a nice result. Also, we can see some selectivity of our nanoparticles to the to, to cancer cells, cervical cancer cells. We also uh, did a lot of experiments, namely uptakes, uh, uptake cellular internalization of the cells. These are these images are from uh, are, are acquired in the confocal microscopy. So you can see this is cancer, cervical cancer cells. We can see nano, uh, nanoparticles inside of the cells at green and also the release of the compound CH. Uh, so you can see that our nanoparticle is re releasing the cytoplasm of the, of the cells after a few minutes. Also, we determine the uptake by flu cytometry and also the release of our drugs in the, into the cells are uh, in less than five hours. So we, we also determine the release. Uh, also, I present this, this, this um, also this microscopy uh, uh, confocal image that show also that our this is also cervical cancer cell lines, and uh, I can this I can show you that uh, in this image I can show you that uh, our um, uh, nanoparticle. Uh, can uh, recognize nucleolin that is the target of the, the, the mer in cells. So these are the red is the nucleolin that is overexpressed in the surface of the membrane of the cervical cancer cells, and also recognize 
the, uh, the nanoparticle at the surface. So this is a, a nice result also. That means that our uh, nanoparticle enter in, into the cells via nucleolin, that is the target of the, the heptamer, the G quadruplex heptamer. So uh, you, we, uh, during the, the, these two years, we, we uh, under task three, uh, we went further. This is another part of the project that we innovate. Uh, so we, we, after that, we, we start to working with the biopsies of human uh, infect with human papillovirus that have uh, uh, precancer lesions. So uh, this, this, these biopsies of these women are given by IPATIMUP and the Centro Hospitalar Universitario Cova da Beira. So uh, we, we would like to, to, to know if our nanoparticles also uh, internalize tissues and how uh, uh, real tissues, real samples, uh, and uh, how, how it, it works. So uh, we use SIN1, SIN2, SIN and SIN3 are uh, pre are uh, uh, low-grade SIN1, and SIN2 and SIN3 are high-grade lesions uh, caused by human papillovirus. So are not in, uh, in cancer yet, but SIN3 progress to cancer if there are no treatment. Uh, usually the treatment is surgery, so uh, we intend to, to minimize these, 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 these effects of the surgery. So we use uh, these, these samples. We evaluate first if the, the, the protein is expressed in the tissues of these samples, and we use the confocal microscopy to prove that. So we can show you in this slide that at red, uh, the, the nucleolin is, is expressed in these tissues. And also, we, in, uh, we, we can, we, we, in this another uh, image, we, 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 show, uh, we, sorry, we, we show you that the, our nanoparticle also internalize and uh, the tissues of uh, these, these samples. Uh, so we and also localize uh, uh, nucleolin. So we can we can also show you that in tissues happens the same that in cells. Okay, that all in the cervical cancer cell line. So this is a nice result. Also, we, we try to check uh, and try to continue to work uh, with this uh, with these samples um, to check the ability and uh, so on. Uh, finally, uh, under also in, in under task three, we select some nanoparticles to formulate as a product, a prototype product, uh, uh, in collaboration with the, the company LabFit. So we select uh, two nanoparticles, and uh, you use the formulation that we use is a common formulation with a, a common placebo. Uh, we in, in, uh, incubate uh, our um, uh, nanoparticle in the formulation, and we use, I present here to, to the results of uh, one, one system that we test permeation of our uh, nanoparticle in the vaginal tissue uh, with two different percentages of, of, of uh, polyethylenoglycol. Uh, propylenoglycol, sorry. So we incubate our, our we, we, we synthesize two, two formulations with two nanoparticles with different uh, percentages of propylenoglycol. Uh, so you can see that the 10% of the formulation is the best, the best, this is a promising uh, uh, pro prototype because it retains most of the, 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 the nanoparticle in the vaginal tissue. So we also uh, perform uh, more experiments, namely viability, release, and so on at the moment. So our project will end uh, tomorrow. <laughs> um, and um, so uh, I will uh, uh, do some conclusions of the project, but uh, I, I would like to show you this, this slide because this, I think, uh, resume very well uh, the mechanism of the action of our nanoparticles. So uh, with, uh, we, we, 
evaluated the, the first we synthesized the nanoparticles we encapsulate the drugs in different uh, in two different uh, delivery systems and our nanoparticles internalize the cervical cancer cells and the uh, human papillovirus infect cells so in the two different stages in the infection and in cancer via nucleolin uh, protein that is uh, on the surface of uh, of the cells after after that after entering the, into into the cells via nucleolin our nanoparticles release the antiviral or anti cancer drug and we will we evaluate the, the effects in terms of uh, uh, decrease of genome copies of the virus, uh, viability of the cancer cells, um, viral title. So in, in two in two stages, in the infection stage and in cancer stage. Um, so some conclusions. So during the project, we synthesized several uh, nanoparticles and characterize them. Uh, uh, so we, we sell one ligand, one potential drug that is a CH uh, uh, ligand, uh, decrease in the number of uh, human papillovirus 18 genome co copies and viral titers. So it's, it's a, a nice result. Uh, also, we, 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 we also study the mechanism that uh, affecting the genomic oxidation of the virus. Also, in terms of anti-cancer effect, we have some selectivity to, to the cancer cells versus non-malignant cells. So we, uh, we have a low cytotoxic to non-malignant cells uh, instead and high cytotoxic to malignant cells. Also, we, we went further and used human tissues and also uh, uh, evaluate the, the nanoparticles in uh, human in human biopsies of, uh, of, uh, of people infect with a human papillovirus in different uh, uh, lesions. And uh, uh, we formulate uh, a nanoparticle as a, a prototype product to, to be applied in the thermal, to, for topical application. And we also show that the 10% of this, this formulation is, is very promising in terms of, of results of release of the compound and the permeation of the vaginal tissue after a few hours and, and stay retained in the, in the vaginal tissue. And this, this formulation can be explored in the preclinical pre trial. So for that, we need to, to continue our, our uh, research plan <laughs> uh, because we, we did all the fundamental research until now. We have a, a prototype that can continue the study for preclinical uh, uh, trial. So for this, we need to support the uh, funding for continue this work. Also, I can show you some outcomes of the project. So the, we involve uh, a lot of students in this project, a lot of collaborators. We disseminate our results in the international conference, national conference. We have two awards also. And we, we, we have also published uh, a significant number of papers. And also in collaboration with our um, partner from UT Austin. So I would like to, to acknowledge to my team at the uh, Centro de Investigação em Ciências da Saúde da Universidade do Interior, uh, to IFCT UT Austin Portugal Program for the funding, also another other agencies that, uh, that support us, uh, to my partners, of course, and to other colleagues from another institution. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Carla, for your very nice presentation. You're no longer dreaming because you brought us very concrete <laughs> results. So you really need to revise the, the title of your project. Congratulations. And I'm really sorry because we can't uh, bring up any questions, but I was just told by the organizing team that we really have to move on to the next presentation. OK, thank you very thank you, much. Thank, thank you, you for your help, for your support. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I'm really sorry because we're running out of time. And um, 
Our next presentation is about another set of activities that we have been uh, implementing since 2018. So uh, it's all about education. And in this particular case, we're bringing to your attention uh, the Advanced Computing Training Program. So this is, was one of a kind uh, pilot training initiative that allowed uh, several uh, Portuguese researchers to spend some time in Austin in the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which, is, which uh, operates, designs and operates some of the, uh, the world's most powerful computing resources. And I just want to bring to your attention some numbers related to this initiative. So all of the ACTP participants who completed their placement over a year ago said they would recommend this activity. Nine effective placements out of 14 applications were funded by the program. So we had uh, 724 days of immersive hands-on training at UT Austin, in particular at TAC, between 2018 and 2019. And five out of nine participants submitted proposals to uh, further funding schemes. One uh, of these uh, participants has recently been hired to work at the Mino Advanced Computing Center for his, uh, his experience at TAC. Uh, was very determinant. So just to uh, talk us about this initiative, uh, we have the pleasure to uh, count on the testimonial of Dan Stanzione. He's the executive director of the Tax Advanced Computing Center. He'll be joining us from Austin. And we'll also have here with us uh, Juan Barbosa. He is a former uh, research associate at TAG, and he has been, he had the opportunity to mentor some of the participants uh, that took uh, part in this initiative. So thank you very much, Juan, and thank you very much, Dan. I'm not sure if you're already connected. Yes, you are. Dan? I am. Good I'm morning. Here. Good morning. How are you doing? Good afternoon. Doing well. Thank you for distracting me. On the <laughs> Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be here with us today. Okay, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. And thanks for the invitation to speak and to tell you a little bit about this program that we think is uh, very exciting. I'm going to go ahead and share the slides here. It looks like you can see them on the screen there now. Excellent. So, um, and yes, Zhao will be joining me, who spent several years here, many years here in Austin, um, helping put this program together. And we just want to give you a little bit of background about this in the next uh, little, little less than 15 minutes, we hope. So, uh, yeah, as you all know, advanced computing is one of the three focus areas we picked out for this iteration of the UT Austin Portugal project um, that started just a couple of years ago. Um, and we see advanced computing to be not just about building big computers, although that is certainly something we're very good at and very proud of. Um, and you see a picture of the NSF Frontera system there. Um, Frontera is the, the largest academic supercomputer in the world at the moment and uh, one of the largest machines in the world. Um, for briefly in 2019, for many problems, it was the fastest machine in the world. So. Um, but it's a pretty complicated piece of hardware and to really do effective science and engineering with this kind of computing, you need to know um, not only a lot about big computer systems and how they work, but a lot about software, a lot about numerical methods, a lot about applied mathematics, a lot about visualization and how you interpret results um, through machine learning or through the uh, uh, other sorts of analytics techniques to look at the data that comes out of these systems. Uh, so there's really a lot of skills that we need people to have, which was sort of the genesis for this program. And you know, advanced computing is used sort of ubiquitously across the sciences at this point. Um, the examples I have on the screen are in the bot, starting at the bottom, severe storm forecasting, uh, jet engine design, that's actually rocket engine design for the Firefly uh, small satellite launch system. Um, some work from Stephen Hawking a few years ago with colliding black holes. Um, on top and the LIGO instruments looking at gravitational wave detection. Um, but we use this in all sorts of fields of science in medicine. Um, this year at TAC, obviously our largest focus has been on understanding uh, the, the mechanisms by which the coronavirus operates and how it spreads and in designing vaccines around that. It's been about a third of our resources this year um, has been spent on that. So just to very briefly tell you about TAC, we, if you don't know about us, the Texas Advanced Computing Center um, 
and now our sister facility in, at the Minho Advanced Computing Center in Portugal, uh, which we, we hope will uh, follow in our footsteps in many of these things and blaze some new trails. But TAC is about 185 people um, who work on advanced computing. We have um, nearly 12 megawatts of computing across multiple buildings and visualization centers. Um, we have the, the two of the 25 largest systems in the world among our about 15 production platforms. We do about 9 billion computing hours per year for many thousands of projects. Um, and we've always been proud members of this collaboration from the very start of it. Uh, this collaboration brought me to Portugal the first time in, I believe, 2008. Um, it was just getting started uh, into Coimbra to teach a summer course. Um, and the collaboration has grown over time and we work together on systems and software and research work. We have some of the projects that Andrea was talking about um, uh, are now currently at TAC looking at sort of big data software stacks with some universities and companies in Portugal. Um, we also send hardware. So this is uh, the former TAC Stampede system, which now is the first machine in Minho, uh, first large scale computing system, um, moved from Austin to Portugal uh, about two years ago. Um, but what this training program has been about is now that we have the hardware in place and the research in place, um, we need to develop people together and try and learn from one another as we move forward. So um, when the collaboration got started years ago, um, you know, we would come to Portugal some and people would come from Portugal to Austin some. Um, and we always found uh, bright and enthusiastic students there to work with. Um, some of them came to Austin. Zhao was among the first about 10 years ago. Uh, and we always did exciting and excellent work together. Um, and felt like we wanted to do more. Um, but it, it, you know, so we came up with this concept of a training program. But the kinds of things that we do in advanced in an advanced computing center um, are really varied. And there's a lot of different things that we do. And it can be hard to capture that in something that we can do in a formal curriculum in a classroom. And we wanted to find a better way to sort of train people to do this. And what we decided was that the best way to learn these skills is just to do them. Um, and we, again, since we'd always found excellent partners in Portugal, um, we thought the best way to help develop staff for Mac in Minho and for uh, the research computing facilities and other universities around Portugal was just to have the com people come and embed with us for a few months. So we created this training program as sort of an extended hands-on experience that has less formal training. There's a little bit of classroom uh, pieces to it, but it's more just getting right to work and getting onto a project with our team and sort of understanding how we can do things together. And everyone from Portugal ha has pushed us forward as a, uh, Andrea mentioned at the beginning, uh, we had a formal application process that happens about once a year. We're a little delayed this year because travel is so complicated, but um, we had reviewers from UT and from Portugal. And from those, we select uh, three cohorts for per year. We like people to come as sort of part of a small group than on their own, but you know, three or four at a time. They come to us for about 12 weeks each. So in the fall and the spring and the summer, um, and it's been a mix of graduate students and postdocs and even some junior faculty um, have come for a visit. We've had other senior faculty come visit multiple times. Uh, so we've been very excited about what's happening here. And I want to uh, turn it over to Zhao at this point, since he is in the room and can tell you about some of the participants in the process and the projects they have done. Thank you so much, Dan. So we had a total of nine people coming in into TAC. All of them are either postdocs. Um, some of them have already finished their PhD. Um, a couple of faculty, I'm remembering Ariel, that is somewhere in there. They were divided into basically three groups. Uh, one came in the spring, uh, the second one um, during summer, and then during the fall. The idea was to spread them around as much as possible through the center, uh, since our goal was basically to train um, these um, individuals to kind of support um, MAC as um, in the, the excellent centers that probably will, will come up in, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, the idea was to spread them around as much as possible through the center so that they can um, get experience on all the areas that TAC does, 
from the advanced computing systems, which mainly handles our machines and tuning the hardware and making sure that everything runs through the HPC that helps users um, focus and bring applications into the HPC and that they are also tuned and perform well to the visualization, to life sciences that is dedicated mainly to working with researchers from life sciences, uh, health sciences and so forth. So the idea was to give them, uh, spread them around so that they all have at least a view of how TAC operates, how they can link into the teams, how we do user support since our major success comes from, uh, from tech support, user support. So we focus a lot on, on those aspects. Sorry, Ben, could you advance? So besides the little bit of formal training that we did, which is basically just teach them how things are run and a little bit of how the application, uh, how we tune up applications and so forth, uh, some basic programming skills that are needed very light things. They were basically requested to integrate one tag project, something that we were working on, and a, bring a project of their own. It's something different if you are forced into a team and you need to gain expertise on the field that that team is working on, and having something that you are a domain expert on, and you can actually see exactly what you're doing and understand exactly how you apply the, the techniques that we typically use um, on your personal research. It gives you a lot more feedback and it teaches you a lot more than, than just um, the training on someone else's project, right? Daniel, do you mind? So besides the project themselves, they were able to do other things, right? Um, for instance, Anna Carolina was one of our interns. We were assembling uh, Frontera, and we had to lay miles and miles of fiber optic cables. She actually was involved in that. She actually went into the data center room and actually performed those, those, those steps. Um, she also had the pleasure of teaching one of our courses. Um, we invited her to, to do that since it's part of our user support to teach those courses. We actually invited her and challenged her to do that and she did. So it's on, on the bottom. Uh, there's a couple of other images. They were able to participate in other activities that we have. We have a huge educational outreach program for um, high school, middle schools and so forth where we bring kids from these schools into the data center and teach them a couple of things about programming, um, robotics, uh, HPC, and so forth. Uh, so they were able to join those. And actually there's um, two photos using our stallion display. Two of the interns that went in um, actually were in the visualization group. They were trained on how to use these displays and how to, to assemble them. And at the end, they actually both used it to one of the major things that these display walls are designed for, which is scientific communication. It gives you a lot of pixels and it allows you to write, actually show detail. And they love that, so they, they actually use that. Next slide, please. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, as Dan mentioned, and, and uh, so did Andrea, uh, one of our interns is actually now joining tech. Um, his name is Jean Diaz. This is a movie from East Tay at, at Austin uh, by the UT pro program. Um, you can actually go into the website and see it. I'm not going to play it through, uh, but it's on the UT uh, Austin Portugal program. Just go there and see it. It's actually fun. Um, so he's joining tech. So the cooperation is still going. Uh, most of our projects, most of our interns actually came to us and proposed projects with us to the, the program itself. There's collaboration going on. Uh, there's collaboration going on on uh, health data sciences with Kelly Gaither, which is the director of that specific area. Uh, there's collaborations going on with the visualization team that I'm aware of. Uh, so all the bonds that were created are still there 
and the goal that we designed for this training, which was mainly to promote cooperation between the two sides, is actually being fulfilled. And then I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Zhao, and let the video keep playing. But uh, so obviously, this year with the pandemic, we've had to slow down a bit on this activity uh, because uh, even if you could come and come to the office, you'd be almost by yourself there because we only have a few people in the building um, uh, since March or so. Uh, most days, we only have ten or twelve people out of our hundred and eighty. Uh, actually at work, but yes, as uh, Zhao here explains, his work uh, from the GRACE satellite, which looks at the gravitational variations due to weight and water um, in the planet. So um, so he did uh, some excellent work, as every member of this uh, training group has done so far. Uh, so, and I think he would tell you he had a great time, and as Zhao Barbosa mentioned, he's joining uh, the staff at MAC, and at least uh, three of the others have come back and are working at other Portuguese universities full-time in supporting uh, sort of high-performance computing-related efforts uh, back at their home institutions. So we're very excited about the progress that has been made. Um, I think the rest of this, well, he has to show off the data center, and then he'll show you where he goes to get a beer um, soon thereafter. Uh, so, and yes, the stampede's still there um, in the data center and machine that is my, my background as well. So. Uh, so let me just move to the last slide here and say um, that though this year has been difficult, we hope certainly by late 2021 or into 2022 to start uh, the collaboration again. And we hope that uh, some of you can come and join us. And uh, since I only have 38 seconds left, I will stop right there and maybe we can squeeze in one short question. Thanks for the great presentation. The, the duo was just amazing. But I actually have a question if the organization allows me to bring it up. So, João, uh, thank you, Dan. I don't know if you're still with us, maybe? I am. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I actually have a question uh, to, to, to João. Um, what, you know, what piece of advice would you give to someone who was planning to spend some time in Austin just to make the most of this experience? Because this can be really life, you know, life-changing experience, and we had you just the, Joel was featured in that, in that video. You know, he is now uh, working, collaborating with Max. So this can be really life-changing. But you have to, you have to have a plan, you know, just to make the most of the experience. So what would you, what advice would you give to, to potential uh, participants? Well, my advice would be first of all, keep an open mind. Um, what you're going to experience in terms of academics in Austin is going to be completely different from what it is uh, in Portugal, at least from my personal experience. Let's, let's make that caveat. For my personal experience, it's going to be different. Um, they will push you to the limit. Uh, and if you are willing to, will break you, build you again, and you will become on the other side better. So th that's one of the things. Uh, and enjoy the ride. It's, it's a great city. It's an awesome place. Um, people are friendly. Um, everyone is going to welcome you open-armed. Uh, they, they don't how can I put this? Uh, let me see if I can find a word. Uh, they don't judge you for anything. Uh, as long as you are willing to work, you're going to be fine. So, thank you once again, Dan. Thank you for waking up so early in the morning to join us. <laughs> see you soon. 
Okay, so we are now moving on to the next presentation. I'm not sure if Stefan is already online, but very quickly, so we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about a strategic research project that has been recently funded by the program. So strategic research projects are large scale, up to three years, highly innovative projects led by Portuguese companies. So making sure that research is turned into innovation with social and economic impact and aiming to lead to new or improved products, services, applications, uh, etc., with international exploitation potential. And we are bringing to uh, your attention today uh, a very interesting project that is shaping uh, um, the, the, the treatment uh, uh, of pro in the, the future of proton therapy. So basically through breakthroughs in uh, uh, cancer treatment equipment. And the project concerned is TOFPET. So this is a project uh, in the area of medical physics, which is one of the areas of the program. And it's led by Patsy's Electronics. Uh, that aims at developing an improved PET system prototype to be used in prothen uh, therapy equipment better suited for radiation monitoring of head and neck cancers. And to uh, walk us through this project, we have uh, with us Stefan Tavernier. Uh, he's uh, um, one of the, the founders of company Patsy's Electronicus is joining us online. He, in 2010, he retired as a full professor at the University of Brussels to, to found this, this company, a very pr promising company uh, in the area of uh, cancer treatment equipment. So thank you, Stefan, for joining us today. Uh, I know that you're not in Portugal. That, w that was one of the reasons why you could not join us here today uh, in person. But thank you anyway for, for being with us today. Thank you. So you have 15 minutes, okay? I don't know if uh, you can hear us. We cannot hear you. So, yes, I okay, was muted. You. Sorry, now you hear me, I presume. So thank you very much for giving, for inviting me and giving me a chance to talk about this project. So let me share my uh, presentation, which I hope should work fine. So do you see my presentation? I presume you see it. You, you, are you seeing the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, very good. So, um, so the, the name of the project is TOFPET for Proton Therapy. And uh, just to situate the context a little bit, so you of course all know that Portugal will have a Proton Therapy Center in Lisbon in a couple of years from now. And uh, there was a call for proposals which aimed at enhancing the scientific and technical knowledge in this area in Portugal, because this is new in Portugal. And uh, so this was basically the aim. So we set up a project uh, which uh, this led by uh, the company, a startup company, Patches Electronics, and that is required by uh, the, the, the system. Um, and of course, we have uh, partners in, in Austin, so the, the University of Texas at Austin and the MD Anderson Proton Therapy Center there. And in Portugal, we have the pleasure to have uh, three excellent academic teams that uh, join us uh, in this project, and they are listed here. Uh, so I don't think I need to go through that in any detail. Um, so let me try and explain what is the whole idea and the whole aim of the project. So uh, you certainly know that the most common way to do cancer radiation treatment of cancer is done with gamma rays. Now gamma rays are sort of X-rays with higher energy, so they have higher penetrating power. And so you irradiate uh, that patient and uh, you irradiate them from different angles around it. And you have a machine as is here. So this is still a relatively big machine, but, but still something that fits in a kind of room and the accelerator generating the gamma bees there on top, but it can rotate around the patient. Uh, now there is another method that can be used and is used. And that is based on, instead of using gamma rays, on using protons. Now, uh, to produce protons, you need a bigger machine uh, because it's harder to produce protons of the energy you need than to produce 
gamma rays. And there are several ways to do it, but the typical way is a cyclotron, and that's the kind of machine you see here. So there's no person there, but the kind of person standing here, you can see this pretty big machine. Uh, it would probably also be a little bit frightening for patient if you would uh, put them in front of this machine. So the patient doesn't see that machine, the patient sees something like this. Um, so this big machine is outside, the patient doesn't see it, but you have the beam that arrives there from, and again, this beam can rotate around the patient, and in this way, he is uh, treated. Uh, now, the whole reason of all that is the following. Uh, in this trigger, you see the the effect of sending a beam, either a gamma beam or a proton beam on, on, on the human being, on the tissue. So to the left, you see what happens if you uh, if send a gamma ray, uh, there is a photon beam, but it's meant gamma rays uh, on the patient. So a, a, a photon beam is like X-ray. So they decay exponentially in the body of the patient. Uh, and uh, of course, that would not be very good for treatment because you would irradiate uh, uh, all along that line. And so to put more radiation on the part that you really want to irradiate, you are rotating this gamma beam around the source of gammas around the patient and always constant making sure that the beam goes through the area that you want to irradiate. Uh, and that is how it works. Uh, so you do irradiate uh, effectively the parts that you want to irradiate, but you also irradiate unavoidably quite a lot of tissue around this. You just put more because you or orient it to that part. You put more radiation in the part where you really want to have the biggest effect. Now, a proton beam is rather different, and that is shown on the picture below to the right. A proton beam uh, enters uh, the, the, the patient and, and as it enters the patient, the, the protons slow down, they, they lose energy, they slow down. And as they slow down, the radiation damage, the radiation dose they deposit in the patient increases. And it is maximum at the end of the range and then it drops to zero. So you see already one big difference is there is no irradiation beyond the point that you want to irradiate. And uh, before the point that you want to radiate, uh, there is less radiation that at the maximum point. That's different from um, uh, a gamma beam, right? Or there's more radiation beyond of it. So it has obviously uh, a big advantage, uh, but it also has a big drawback that you have a much uh, more complicated and expensive piece of equipment. So it's really important to use a proton beam in cases where the, the cancer you need to irradiate is close to some tissue that you absolutely do not want to irradiate because it's crucial for the being. So um, experience shows that uh, uh, one needs about uh, one proton beam machine for um, 10 million people. So it's normal that Portugal uh, will have that equipment. Um, and uh, that is what is going to happen. So to illustrate this principle a bit better, I show here a, a picture of, uh, this is pictures from, from a real treatment of, of a real patient and uh, that patient had some area in, in the lungs that there was a cancer that needed to be radiated and that was close to the heart and you can imagine you don't want to radiate the heart too much. Uh, and you see here the difference really illustrated. The top image uh, shows you in color code how much radiation is deposited in a particular part of the tissue. And of course, you put the maximum irradiation in the part that's red there, and that is the part that needed to be irradiated. But you put a lot of irradiation elsewhere uh, around it, and in particular in the heart. With, uh, and if you would, if it's used for proton irradiation, then you get the situation as on the lower picture where you have just two beams that uh, concentrate on this point. And indeed you still have some radiation um, outside the area that you really need to radiate. But of course it's much, much better than the case of uh, uh, gamma radiation. 
Now, this works very well, uh, but there is one difficulty. And that difficulty is that you need to be sure of the range of the proton, the direction of the proton. Of course, you know that the patient is you shoot it in the right direction, but how do you know exactly how deep the uh, uh, beam will penetrate before it stops? Because that is crucial. And the way that is done in practice is that one has a CT image of the patient when make that image, that CT image before the radiation. And the CT image is basically an X-ray image in three dimensions. So you see the tissue of the patient and uh, you have to estimate the stopping power for photons from the CT image. The problem is that that is not really entirely possible because stopping gammas or uh, slowing down protons is a different physical process and you cannot in a straightforward way derive the stopping power for photons from the CT image. Essentially uh, if you know exactly the composition of a tissue then of course you say this is a CT image and I have this density of material I can calculate the stopping power for protons but I do not know the composition of the tissue with high precision. For example, the tissue can contain more or less water. Now water uh, shows up very little, has very little stopping power for the, the X-rays that is very effective in stopping uh, the, the slowing down the proton beam. So depending if the tissue has more or less water, uh, which you cannot see on the on the CT image, it will be more effective in stopping or slowing down the proton beam. And you can be uh, wrong on the exact range of this proton beam by as much as one centimeter. Now, this is of course pretty bad because the whole point about proton beam is that you are sure that nothing is irradiated beyond the end point of the beam because you do it when there is some tissue there that you absolutely should not irradiate, but then if you're wrong by one centimeter, it's really not good. Um, so how uh, can you solve that? Well, you have somehow to measure the position of the beam during irradiation. So the patient is brought in position, you shoot a small fraction of the total beam that you want uh, uh, to use. And you see, you try to measure and where is the end point of that beam and check that it is what you think it should be. Now, there are essentially two ways to do that. One way is to use uh, prompt gamma rays. Now, prompt uh, refers to the fact that those gamma rays are emitted immediately. So you have a proton beam and those protons go in the tissue. They induce some nuclear reactions, not that many, but induce some nuclear reactions. And in those nuclear reactions, sometimes, a gamma ray is emitted, just one fairly energetic gamma, typically for uh, uh, MEV or well, there are several lines in there. And you can observe those gammas and then you will see uh, essentially where uh, the beam stops. Uh, now the end point of the beam and the end point of the emission of gammas is not exactly the same, but you can simulate that and, and you can correct for that effect. Uh, another way is to use a positron emission tomography. Uh, and so, because this proton beam also induces nuclear reactions that introduce positron emitting isotopes. And if a positron emitting isotopes emit a positron, that means an electron, and that also gives, in this case, two gamma rays that go in exactly opposite direction. And you can observe those, and you do the same thing. You know uh, where the beam is. Now, the, 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 the isotopes that are most relevant in this and that are produced are on one hand carbon 11, which has a 20 minute decay time and oxygen 15, which has two minute decay time. Now, obviously the most important one is the oxygen. For one thing, you do not want to wait very long uh, after the radiation to do the measurement, because those things have, of course, you don't want to make the patient there longer. The, the other uh, uh, thing is that the, uh, after the radiation, this is a live tissue, there is blood circulating in those uh, positron emitting isotopes may move and may not be anymore at the, at the place where they were produced. So basically you're looking 
at the, the uh, the oxygen 15, the uh, positrons that are emitted by the oxygen 15, and they have a decay time of two minutes. So you, in a few minutes, you have uh, uh, the image that you really want. Uh, now, eventually, uh, but that is a, may, maybe a very ambitious goal in the long term, eventually it may be possible to at the same time as you radiate the patient, if you have injected in a suitable isotope that makes, makes the tumor that you want to radiate visible, you would have almost the best of all worlds, right? You would see in the same imaging device, the tumor you want to radiate and, and the position of the beam, and then you would really feel sure that you're doing it right. But I must admit this second is maybe a very ambitious goal. Um, so, the problem though, and why is it not the obvious way to go to use positrons? Well, the problem is that you may know that in order to have a decent um, PET image, you need to surround the patient completely with a PET detector. So you, you know, all PET detectors have a big ring that surrounds the patient and you need that ring, otherwise you can't make an image. Um, now, except that if you have a PET detector where the timing resolution is very good, then you can relax on the condition to have a full ring. Now, the problem is that you have seen the radiation situation, uh, the proton beam, it is not really feasible to put a full ring there because there are all sorts of things there and the beam and so on. So basically putting a full, a full ring there is, is uh, in practice not doable. But if you could work with a partial ring as shown here, then it could work. Um, uh, a partial ring can work if you uh, have a PET detector that has very good time resolution. Now it so happens that the company uh, Petsys Electronics has exactly uh, that speciality that we have PET detectors that have really a superior time resolution. And that's why we were approved because we really had a technology that was crucial to make this uh, approach work. So the, um, the whole uh, the activity then in this project that has just started is on one on the first stage, of course, we have to uh, build the PET detectors and, and assemble and do that. And that's what we are doing now. And that's basically done with the company Petsys and, and UT Austin. Of course, there is a very important and very essential part of the work this is simulation and image reconstruction. And there is Lee Ignas and, and MD Anderson who are very active on this uh, and, and will take care of this. And there are biological studies and that is very similar to the first talk uh, that you have heard when you can use nanoparticles. And the idea is to look uh, if nanoparticles can be effective in enhancing the radiation therapy effect so that if you would give the right nanoparticles and bring that in the, in the tumor you want to, to radiate and you need to irradiate that those nanoparticles to make the treatment uh, more effective. So this is uh, some quite interesting, more fundamental studies that are also part of it. And of course, um, MD Anderson is involved, but there the beam test will be done. Let me just point out that we will not irradiate patients in this project because that would not be possible in the time that we have, and that would probably also need more resources. So what we will design the detector, and when we will do studies uh, with uh, phantoms, of course, objects uh, to test, of course, and with animals where we can study the effect of the nanoparticles in, in living organism and, and make sure that it uh, produces the desired effect. So what is the, the outcome that we expect from this uh, project when it will be uh, at the end? Well, there are several. Uh, one important outcome is that we will have conclusions uh, on, or, um, on the effectiveness of nanoparticles in enhancing the effectiveness of the radiation therapy. We will certainly have uh, bring more light on the merits of using uh, uh, PET 
positron emission tomography compared to prompt gammas. Now, I think everybody agrees that that, if you can really make it work properly, would be superior uh, to prompt gammas, but it's certainly more difficult to implement. And uh, so the result of this study could be that, yes, we are able to solve the technical problems, and this is a valid way to, uh, to approach uh, range verification in proton therapy. And of course, uh, 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 commercial companies involved because uh, we hope that uh, maybe if all this goes well, that will eventually be turned into um, a commercial product. Now, let me immediately say that um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we would be producing a commercial uh, patch system for proton therapy. Also, at a, a somewhat less ambitious uh, sample in. Uh, in, in this project, we will develop and improve PET detector models that we have, and we will certainly have a positive result on using those PET detectors in other applications than uh, proton therapy, because PET detectors with a good uh, time resolution are useful in many other applications. We're really sure that Stefan, from the company's point of view, this will have some positive... Stefan, economy. sorry, uh, may I interrupt you? Sure. We really need to come to an end. Sorry, I apologize. Can you just really quickly uh, wrap up? <laughs> sorry. It's the end. Okay, great. I, I cannot uh, ask you any question because I'm, I'm being really asked by the organizing team just to to move on to the next presentation. I really apologize, but this looks a very promising uh, project. I have obviously many questions to ask you, but I will have to leave them to another occasion. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, so, we're now moving on to uh, the next presentation by Tiago Ormigo. Tiago is the co-founder of Spinworkers and is also coordinating another strategic research project in the area of space-earth interactions. The project concern is Project Upgrade and it aims at developing the world's first miniaturized space accelerometer dedicated to observing Earth's gravitational field variations. Thank you very much, uh, Tiago, for accepting this invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It wasn't something uh, <laughs> we tend to expect, but, uh, but it was, it's very nice to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm here to present a, a project in which we have been involved with the University of Austin, um, of Texas at Austin. Uh, we were actually invited by the, by the team there at the Center of, for Space Research to uh, developed together with them uh, a new concept that basically follows uh, the, the kind of uh, technologies that have been already developed at full-scale spacecraft. So um, just going into the, the kind of things that we are studying, um, the, the entire goal of this, uh, of this project is around the, the concept of measuring how the gravity is affected over time and in space um, and measuring it from orbit. Um, this is not something that's, that's uh, very intuitive. Um, the, the idea here is that we, we get a sense of how it varies not just in, in space, which is, which is basically what, what we usually think of when, when we think of measuring how the gravity is just distributed around the Earth, but there, there's also a time-varying um, time component. And this time-varying component is not... Uh, Intuitive, either, <laughs> and and the idea here is that uh, by by measuring um, a combination of things, we can get into the time varying gravity as well. And the the concept that was explored by previous missions, especially the NASA Grace mission, was that um, you can actually measure what is going on with your spacecraft in terms of accelerations um, by using just GNSS data. 
together with the ranging data. And by having accelerometers on board, you can uh, just take out the component that, that corresponds to the, um, to the uh, gra non-gravitational accelerations. And putting it together, um, this means that, that you can figure out um, a number of different components here. So I'll, I'll just go into this, uh, is this, is this working or? Oh, we don't have a laser. Uh, so, when you look at the lower, uh, the bottom right image over there, which sounds or and looks very confusing, the um, the red components you see there are the are basically the the uh, the constant uh, components of the gravity, uh, and they are varying in space. So wherever you are, um, they vary with the latitude and the longitude, and then once once uh, you start going into the the blue components that you see there, um, these are r relative to the non-gravitational uh, accelerations, which can be measured by accelerometers. And uh, towards the, so the upper of these graphs indicates uh, between 10 to the minus 6 and, and 10 to the minus 5. That's basically the, the um, aerodynamic drag. Um, and this is the, the most important of these non-gravitational accelerations. And then when you go further down into the 10 minus 7 and below, the other blue component you see there is the solar radiation pressure. So the, the big picture is um, as you go into further uh, accuracy with, for the, with the measurements you are taking, you're, you are getting into different components of uh, the gravity. And as you remove them one by one, and this takes a, a long time and it takes uh, uh, several measurements over the same place at different times, then you start picking up the, the less intense, intensive elements there. So what our goal here is to go into the orange component you see there between 10 to approximately 10 to the minus eight to the 10 to the minus 10 meters per square second. And that means um, basically, one billionth of the intensity of the of the Earth's gra uh, gravity acceleration uh, uh, at the Earth's surface, and so this is this presents a number of difficulties. Y you can see that the gravity field has these components, which are um, relative. Ba basically, they're caused by the the distribution of mass on the surface and on the subsurface of the Earth. And this corresponds maybe to oceans, it may be to mountains. There is a, um, a specific component you see there in, the, in the certain areas of the Earth, which corresponds to areas where you have subduction between. So you have um, the, the tectonic plates of the Pacific in, on, the, on the right hand side of the upper uh, figure there with the globe. You can see a subduction area in the Andes region where there's a lot of the, of the tectonic plates of the Pacific going below the, the, the South American plate. And this raise, raises the, not just raises the, the, the South American plate, but also adds to the mass that is concentrated over there. So there, there is a number of, of things that are related to the uh, surface and subsurface. And then there are uh, things that are uh, caused by, by the lunar and solar um, gravity. Um, so because they are quite massive bodies, um, and then you have, besides from this, you have different influences um, in terms of the liquid components of the Earth's surface and the solid uh, components. So, so you also need to model all of these. And once you, you have modeled and, and withdrawn all of these components, then you get into the interesting part. And that's the concept that we are measuring. We are measuring the, the motion of the water and the ice on the Earth's surface and near subsurface. And this means that we can uh, basically estimate how the, uh, the amount of ice changes, as long as it's on a regional scale and in large, in large quantities, we are measuring how it varies over time. And this means things like the, how much ice we have on top of, the, of Greenland and how much uh, ice we have on, on Antarctic, Antarctica. And furthermore, and, and one, one very interesting thing is that you can actually measure how the water in the subsurface of the Earth is, is varying. And this typically is seasonal. And, and you can see it, um, not here, but if you go into, into the videos describing what the GRACE mission is, is all about, you can see that there are seasonal changes in the levels of water, of subsurface water, in the, in the Amazon, in this, um, the Indian subcontinent, continent and sometimes when you have regional floods such as when you have floods over the entire basin of the Mississippi as you had a few years back you can actually see that and you can actually measure it 
uh, via this, uh, this uh, model that, we, that has been used for NASA GRACE, you can actually measure it in terms of how many millimeters or tens of millimeters of water you have over a regional scale. So the accuracy required for this is, is immense. It, it, 10 to the minus 9 is, is something that we are trying to attempt to do with a nanosatellite, which is our mission. Um, and it's not something that has been um, possible before uh, with a kind of, of uh, or at, the, at the size that, that uh, we are trying to do. Um, so one, one major thing that, that will have a, a huge impact on, on, on our spacecraft is that um, vibrations um, typically occur, um, I mean, they, they might not be large scale. The, the thing is that if there are even small scale, we are trying to measure things at uh, 10 to the minus 9. And, and if you have any flexible components on the, on the spacecraft, like solar arrays that are detached from the rest of the, of the spacecraft, or if you have uh, antennas uh, out, then, then this causes a problem. Furthermore, if you, I just didn't list here, but if you go into the thermal side, you have uh, thermal-induced variations of the, of the structure, and this causes internal stresses, and it causes, uh, it causes um, deformations on the spacecraft, and we need to do, know them very well in advance. So there, is, there are a number of difficulties. These have been dealt by the, the previous mission that, well, right now there, there is a follow-up to that mission, which is GRACE FO, and um, this is the kind of things that we're trying to deal with at the level of a nanosatellite. So going into the, the previous mission, uh, so this is, um, uh, this is really groundbreaking. It, it followed into the footsteps of the CHAMP mission, but it's, it's really the one that defines um, how far we can go using this method. So the idea of this mission was to, to measure the, the Earth's time varying gravity. And for that, it used a couple of spacecraft. And you can see there, the, the spacecraft does not have uh, any uh, detached solar rays. It does not have any detached uh, antenna. It's really, really compact. And it has the, uh, actually the solar rays are, are all around the, the spacecraft. Um, and it does have a number of instruments. One is a GPS receiver, which is accurate to, to about one centimeter. It has um, a microwave ranger uh, uh, with an ultra-stable oscillator. And the, and the reason for that is that uh, you need to, to, to measure the range between these two spacecraft um, with the, exactly the, the, the rate that is needed. And if, it, if it's delayed by any reason, if we are going into things of the sort of 10 to the minus 9 seconds, any nanosecond difference will make a difference in the, in the overall results for the mission. So you need really to take with the, uh, an ultra-stable oscillator uh, along. And then you have an, a high accuracy accelerometer. Um, the, the changes in the range between the spacecraft are not everything, but they're, they're, they provide a lot of clues as to how the gravity is, is varying over space. And this is because the two spacecraft are, are basically following each other uh, with a range of around 200 kilometers. This means around 30 seconds uh, between when one spacecraft over, uh, goes over a certain uh, place um, of the Earth's surface and the second. And these two basically suffer the same consequences of the, of the varying gravity. Uh, and then uh, when you use the GNSS devices and all the measurements from, taken by those devices from the different GNSS satellites, you can put all the data together and figure out what is going on. So um, what, what are we trying to do? Um, instead of a, of a large spacecraft, um, we are trying to, for the moment, to use a single nanosatellite to perform the same kind of mission with miniaturized sensors that we are developing ourselves, um, with the exception of the GNSS sensor. So um, there is a huge effort being done right now by, the, by uh, the CSR, which is a recurring assessment of how far we can go in terms of the scientific objectives of the mission relative to the technical specifications that we can uh, that we can reach with the technologies that are going into the nanosatellite. Of course, we don't have a, a nearly enough uh, money. Uh, well, when compared to the NASA GRACE mission, we are trying to do things at one thousandth of the cost. Uh, but we are using the same principles, and, and at any given time, we have a, a good sense of where we are in terms of the goal, the scientific goal of the mission. 
and this is something that that we are working together with the with the UTA. We have had a, a, a couple of, of meetings already to discuss precisely this, and we are now going into the technical specification part, uh, where we are devising exactly where we want to to go. Um, so the the idea is to have a science-driven mission, but using as much as we possibly can Portuguese technology, and this is this is the key thing. So the the, the opportunity was given to us by the, the, the international partnerships in 2019 to try and work together with, a, with a, 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 an institution such as UT Austin, but there was also the chance of working with other, uh, other universities in the US. And we took it to, to make sure that we could advance as quickly as we possibly could in terms of developing technologies, in terms of preparing ourselves to the, for, for the international market, which is our main goal, and to try and develop our own technologies such that we could potentially also support other, other scientific activities as well as commercial activities. So in this case, what we're trying to do is a high accuracy accelerometer, and this is based on, on INL technology, so the, this is the Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory. Um, they have been developing these technologies for uh, about 10 years or even more. Um, we are using a, our own miniaturized star tracker, which has been developed over time, um, and you can see an image of that on the upper, on the top right there. Um, this is a, an early concept. We have all the algorithms working uh, right now in terms of the image processing. The, all the structure is, is right now undergoing already some, some testing. Um, and we are uh, developing an onboard computer, and this is a, a quite a, a new effort. Um, another thing that we're developing, and this is also um, a key thing for us for the future, is that is a nanosatellite platform. In this case, is a 6U, a relatively simple one. Um, and this is uh, supposed to be used as a modular platform if we're going into um, future um, either products or technologies or scientific experiments based on nanosatellites. This is what this is what we want it to be based on. So we are able to. Uh, build a platform in Portugal and to equip it with the, all the devices that are able to make it uh, fly um, uh, autonomously. And the idea is that we can support not just commercial, uh, commercial projects in the future, but also to uh, provide a platform for scientific experiments. Um, and the idea here is that we are doing all of this and we are trying to reach the same kind of goals as the NASA GRACE mission, but at one thousandth of the volume, so that's one tenth of the d dimensions in each di in each direction, and then at one thousandth of the cost. So the the this uh, NASA GRACE mission was actually not very expensive; it was on the order of a hundred million. Um, but we are trying to do it at a one a one million, uh, and that's the first unit because the, then we're trying to to even lower the price into the, in the uh, lower hundreds, if possible, lower hundreds, hundreds of case. Um, and we are trying to do it at the, um, such that we can reach the same goals. Even if we have a constellation, it will still be one or even perhaps about two orders of magnitude or a close, as close as possible to two orders of magnitude less cost than the NASA GRACE. Um, so how does this all fit into the future? And um, right now, um, we, we have the high accuracy accelerometer, we have a prototype, the same thing for the, for the star tracker. Um, the onboard computer is, is undergoing development. The platform is now uh, being developed as well. So uh, in, the next few months, in the next few months, we'll be able to, to start um, showing the results. And this is the, the main thing that, that we want to say, is that um, the results are not going to be seen uh, after three years, they're going to be coming out uh, in a few months, and then after that, a few more. So this is the, the, final, the final slide. Um, so this is a strategic project and not just for UTA. This is a strategic project for us. And the idea that we have, so you can see the, the camera that we have already developed that's ready and, uh, to fly, and we, we are just waiting for, for the infant project to, to move forward. Um, so the idea is to follow up uh, to, to multiple other activities that we have done. We are building the capacity to integrate small space vehicles uh, in Portugal in support of not just the technology but also the, 
the scientific uh, community. And besides from this, we are developing a number, a number of different things that are going to support not just this project, but uh, that are going to support the development of many other uh, missions, including potentially the Atlantic Constellation. That's, that's the, our main goal. So if you have any questions, I think I'm, I'm done with this. Thank you very much, Tiago. We really have to finish. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, now I'm going to ask our colleagues to play the video on the 11 uh, projects that we've been supporting um, since uh, earlier this year and until uh, 2023. I hope you enjoy it. Today's world is filled with complex problems. But we are more prepared than ever to navigate them thanks to science-based knowledge and international collaboration. This is where UT Austin Portugal comes in. Over the next three years, the long-standing Transatlantic Partnership will support a batch of 11 projects with high innovation potential, led by Portuguese companies alongside research institutions and universities in Portugal and the University of Texas at Austin. With a total investment of 21.9 million euros, these projects will help shape a brighter future for both citizens and businesses by developing innovative solutions to real global challenges. Imagine yourself in a few years. Growing old can be a concern for many of us, especially if aging comes along with reduced mobility. Since motor deficiencies are one of the most severe health problems affecting the elderly, NanoStim will develop a garment with an integrated electrostimulation sensor-based system that allows a personalized rehabilitation of muscle injuries and can be controlled at a distance by health professionals. Since health is at the top of our society's priorities, enhancing our understanding of complex biological interactions is critical. By enabling deep tissue penetration with relatively minor phototoxicity, Multi-photon microscopy is regarded as an effective tool for long-term observations of live tissue and extraction of large amounts of data. Extreme Med will deliver a standalone SYNC RGB flim system that reduces sample exposure to interferences and improves photoprotective conditions. Cancer is the leading cause of death worldwide. When identified early though, Cancer is more likely to respond effectively to treatments, resulting in a greater probability of survival. Remote patient monitoring has been applied for vital signs, but Sentinel is looking at it as a tool to remotely monitor patients with high risk of cancer recurrence. How? By developing a minimally invasive and biocompatible injectable biosensor for early tumor surveillance in post-operative prostate cancer patients. When it comes to cancer treatments, Proton radiation therapy is one of the most advanced and promising types of radiation treatment. However, measuring the distance protons travel to the tumor cells proves challenging in in-bin PET scanning for geometrical reasons, as typically, it takes a ring of detectors surrounding the patient to ensure accurate measurement. Tough PET for proton therapy aims at building a novel prototype tool featuring excellent position resolution suitable for head and neck, improving the performance of proton therapy equipment with increased accurate radiation. Have you ever felt your car is acting kind of crazy no matter how many times you've taken it the mechanic? Since cars have become the ultimate electronic device, no wonder that electromagnetic interference is the culprit sometimes. Being graphene the most promising candidate for effective electromagnetic interference shielding, JAMIS proposes an advanced technological solution that uses graphene liquid dispersions to protect electronic components, making it highly suited to meet the requirements of demanding vehicle industries. Speaking of demanding vehicle industries, the premature degradation of cutting tool materials is one of the problems that both aerospace and automotive industries face. MC Tool 21 seeks to improve the machinability of alloys through both an optimized coating system and a set of simulation tools that will significantly reduce the wear and tear inflicted by hard-to-machine materials on cutting tools. Existing measure devices for manufacturing processes fail many times to evaluate important process parameters due to issues with sensors placement and their signal acquisition. Thin film technology loaded with sensors applied directly to the equipment looks promising, but installation can be rather tricky. 
Soft for Sense intends to create a software that will guide the deposition of layer-thin films on top of equipment to avoid mechanical problems during installation. Although water is crucial to our survival, the relationship between human activities and water resources has created a number of threats, harmful to natural ecosystems and human beings themselves. Water pollution is one of those threats, with several health risks being associated with the detection of inorganic contaminants in surface and groundwaters. NanoCatRed relies on groundbreaking nanostructure catalysts to achieve a step change in the performance of catalysts for hydrogenation of inorganic contaminants without generating concentrated secondary waste streams. Oceans are the heart of our planet's weather and climate systems. With climate change emerging as one of the critical issues of our times, Magal Constellation will develop the next generation of radar altimeter instruments to be adapted to a future constellation of small satellites that can understand long-term variability in climate due to changes in sea levels. The rate at which permanent ice loss in polar caps are occurring is also a key parameter that indicates how quickly sea levels will change over the next few decades as a result of global warming. Upgrade aims at developing the world's first nano-satellite dedicated to observing Earth's gravitational field variations and measuring the neutral thermosphere along the line of past missions such as CHAMP, GRACE and GOCHI. In the era of big data, computational requirements are significantly substantial while traditional computing resources are not sufficient to support big data applications, raising technological challenges. High-performance computing infrastructures can find it increasingly difficult to manage resources and ensure a fair performance across different workloads. Big HPC will design and implement a novel solution for monitoring and optimally managing the infrastructure, data, and applications of current and next-generation HPC data centers. The future looks bright thanks to projects like the ones supported by UT Austin, Portugal. Altogether, we are creating disruptive science-based knowledge to foster impactful change. Come along with us. Be part of this exciting journey from the lab to the market, from science to innovation. Muito obrigado, muito obrigado ao UT Austin Portugal pela sessão. Nós vamos já continuar a seguir, às quatro da tarde começamos a sessão plenária, a segunda sessão plenária Ciência em Portugal para uma Europa mais social e digital, que terá quatro intervenções convidadas, a Susana Sargento, o Pedro Ferreira, o Ricardo Paes Mamed e o Rui Oliveira. So now on stage for the final speech, uh, Professor Mendonça, a National Director of the UT Austin Portugal Program. Well, good afternoon. I'm not going to take you more than two minutes. The theme of the session was a meeting of minds an ocean apart. That's precisely what we have just got uh, in today's presentations. But it's very unfair to say that it was just a meeting of minds. It was highly qualified, motivated, committed minds working together to foster all the areas of this transatlantic program. Carla Cruz presented as a result of an exploratory project um, that uses nanotechnologies for cancer treatment. Then Stazione and John Barbosa talked about the training program in advanced computing running at TAC to allow Portugal to have very high qualified human resources and with competences in HPC of utmost importance to make the most of the supercomputer UST Austin made available at FCT to the Mac Computer Center. Stefan Tavernier had an exciting theme, the future of protein therapy um, in very advanced cancer therapy equipment. This is being investigated in one, in one of the 11 strategic projects. And finally, Tiago Ormigo, co-founder of Spinworks, brought as the core ideas of a leading project in space-earth interactions uh, and a fruitful collaboration between Texans and Portugal in the new space area. Special thanks to all, to all the presenters. Finally, we watched the video of company-led company strategic projects. I think the video uh, talks by, by, it, by itself 
and we actually, we actually believe all these projects will support a very close collaboration between Portugal and UT Austin research institutions, enterprises, to force us the transformation of science to face all the immense challenges we all have in the program for all the areas. Thank you very much and keep safe.